Okay, so CSR and pachychoroid disorders. Um, so something I'm sure every single one of us sees all the time and most of the time we don't bother about because most of our patients do well. Um, and um, most of us see the acute form, which is, um, you know, this... I must get a uh, laser pointer up here. Um, the serous elevation... And um, if it's been there a little, little time, you can see these little tiny yellow dots. Um, and there are subforms where you may get fr a fibrin deposit. That's more common in Southeast Asian patients. And uh, if you're unlucky, it can be complicated by RP, atrophy, and CNV. Eight out of 10, it will settle down in three to six months with no problems. I have incredibly rare patients that get really acute CSR with horrific vision. And we've, we've worked them up and don't know why. Um, so um, there's a small subgroup that with very acute classic CSR can do badly within, when, and we're trying to work out why, why they do this. Not a new diagnosis, like most things. Um, and in the acute form, if you look at them, um, you, you, if you do the dense OCT, you'll probably find a little elevated bit of RPE, which is here. And that corresponds to usually the leaking point. It's either the ink blot type or the smokestack type. This is the more common ink blot type. And you can kind of work out where the leaky point is just by looking at the OCT. And you can look at the shallow PED. It's often incredibly shallow separation between the RP and Brooks membrane. And again, this is Don Gass's drawing. Pre-OCT, the guy's a genius, isn't he? Look at that. That's, that's like 25, 30 years ago. Um, um, no matter how good anyone in the current era thinks they are a, a medical retina, you go back and look at the gas and you just humbled every single time. So this is Don Gas's drawing, this is the OCT, and this is the fluorescein. So you can kind of almost work out the leaking point just by looking at the OCT. And there's the ink blot variant, um, and then there are other variants of OCT, um, the, the form you get in pregnancy that... Um, you will usually resolve, make sure they're not hypertensive, obviously. Malignant hypertension in pregnancy can cause serious detachment, so that, you know. And then there are the bullous form that's highly unnerving, where you get really, really aggressive, um, massive detachments in the retina. They often end up in my institution between my, uh, my oncology colleagues, my uveitis colleagues, me, and they, some of them even end up getting biopsied because you basically are diagnosed of exclusion. And eventually you hope they settle down. And then there's this chronic form that's... I, I'm very uncomfortable with the definition, so some people define chronic as more than six months. Others des describe it as a subtype with diffuse pigment epithelial changes, which is the way I think of it. So, um, which is almost another disease. Um, this is a beautiful photograph of a bullous CSR. And originally, all of these entities were defined on fluorescein, colors, and then ICG. With ICG, you'd see dilated choroidal vessels, which was difficult in the pre-SLO days, and it was often this um, hyperfluorescent ICG plaque that you got in the late frames. Now that we, if you have a SLO-based ICG, you will actually see um, the plaques, but also in the very late frames, but also quite dilated choroidal vessels. And based on that, um, various groups, um, the New York group and others, started looking at the choroid a lot more and realized um, uh, um, that given the hypothesis that CSR was related to a choroidal permeability problem, that many of these patients had thick choroids, or pachychoroid, which is Greek. That's right, isn't it? Yep, good, yeah. Um, so, um, so, and you get thickening of the Haller's layer, which is the deeper layer, which kind of squashes Sattler's layer, and you may see quite dilated individual vessels. And I hate the term pachy vessel. So my Americans call it pachy vessel. That means to me that the vessel wall is thick, but it's not, it's just, it's dilated. So, I'm not quite sure if that's right. So these are the dilated vessels here. And you, now this is where you need to be careful. You have here uh, elevation of the RP separating Brooks membrane. So some people call it a double layer sign, but the double layer sign is so used in so many different ways, I would just say it's a separation of RP and Brooks membrane. Now I showed earlier 
that that could be the focal point of where the leak is. However, now that we've got angioct, we now realize, especially if it's paraphobial or under the fovea, this could be a type 1 CNV as well. And I'm going to go into that in a little more detail. So as a rule of thumb, your choroidal thickness is, shouldn't be on, for the average emotropicish patient, uh, not greater than the thickness of the retina which is about 250 microns. So this here is about 500 micron thickness choroid. So that's definitely abnormal. Um, and so um, that in both eyes um, makes you think of a thick choroid, which predisposes you to a number of disorders, one of which is CSR. Um, in patients who have CSR in one eye and a thick choroid, We've all known, if you, when you do the imaging, you have changes in the other eye. Now, my uh, American colleagues have described the changes in the other eye where there's no frank CSR as pachychoroid pigment epitheliopathy, where you see um, a variety of changes. You can see, obviously, this probably is just a, su a, a subclinical form of, uh, of uh, uh, CSR anyway, small serous PED. You can see drusen-like deposits or even pattern scallop changes like pattern dystrophies that will hyperautophores. Um, the hypothesis from Bailey is that this is a pigment epitheliopathy primarily derived from um, having a thick choroid. The counter-argument is how do you know they've not had CSR that's just resolved? Because it resolves in 80% of the cases and it could be asymptomatic because it's extra verbeal. And we know when it resolves in the eye you've, you, you've, you're observing, you'll get these changes anyway. So I'm not totally sure if this is a separate entity or it's just the after effect of having CSR. So when CSR resolves, you often get localized drusen deposition. So I often get patients referred who are 45, oh, they've got AMD because they have drusen. But if you look, the drusen are absolutely localized in one little clump and they have a thick choroid. So I say, well, you, you, you have drusen, doesn't equal AMD, and they're largest drusen, but they're all in one clump, everything else is normal, and you have a thick choroid, it, this may be resolved CSR. So <coughs> pachychoroid pigment epitheliopathy. And um, it's now found, now we've got angio-CT on, on certain studies, up to 20% of CSRs that are going on for three to six months will have this um, double layer sign, I hate to use it, the separation of, let me zoom in on here if I can, the separation of RPE and Brooks membrane, where if it's near the fovea, as opposed to the periphery, with an acute CSR, it may be that they've got a, C, a type one CNV complex. And this is where it gets the treatment dilemma. Do you treat it as a CNV or do you not treat it as a CNV? Now, going back to that example I had in my uh, first talk, one of the most useful things that helps me decide is have they had a sudden change in vision or what's their visual acuity? So if they are 6'6", six, 6'9", six, six, and they've been like that and nothing's changed for three to six months and the fluid's going down, I'm not going to do anything, even if they have that. If they're ha having declining vision, uh, obviously I'm assuming there's no hemorrhage, which makes your decision making very easy. If they have declining vision or sudden change in vision and they have this, so you, need, you, can't, vert, you can't diagnose this without angio-CT. It's the one and only thing that I think angio-CT is absolutely outstanding at is this. You can um, see the uh, high flow signal um, here and it's not projection, art. this is not a great example here. It's a high flow signal that's not projection artifact. The other one I showed in the first thing was better because the um, fluorescein and ICG will be nonspecific. Speckled hyperfluorescence and a plaque on ICG, or may, which may or may not be present, won't separate the two. So you need to see the net. Then you need to make a decision, do you need to treat or not? And I'll come back to that later when we go to treatment. <coughs> and then some, but not all, um, um, polypoidal patients have a thick choroid. So then there's this whole notion of this continuity that this thick choroid predisposes some patients to type 1 CMVs, and type 1 CMVs may or may not be part of the evolutionary stage of 
polypoidal or aneurysmal type 1 CNV. So, uh, again, a patient here. This is a very dilated choroidal vessels going through here, elevated uh, RPE uh, area with a query polypoidal nodule in it, and I've shown you this nice diagram before. So I'll, we've gone through the polyps before there. I'll skip. So the polypoidal variant, so this is the whole notion of is there some underlying problem that causes, predisposes you to a thick choroid? Obviously, hypermetropia does, and if you've got some with bullous detachments, then you've got to think of your differential of um, hypermetropia, uh, uvular fusion syndrome, make sure you haven't got a regmatogenous fentanyl detachment, you haven't got a choroidal hemangioma, um, and so on and so forth. And these are, those things are very hard and often uncomfortable to manage. What, why are we getting this? So clearly there seems to be this um, convolution that it's something to do with a choroid. Um, and for a very long time, we've known that corticosteroids are an association, but not in all patients. So one assumes it's a pharmaco um, a genetic response in some way. Nobody's quite worked out that for corticosteroids. We know that uh, some Cushing's patients can get um, CSR, but actually there's a stronger association from a, a Dutch study with Conn syndrome, so uh, hyperaldosteronemia uh, hyper and high blood pressure, which has had a stronger association in the recent Dutch study than that. We know there's the pregnancy-associated form, even without hypertension. The personality type's interesting. So the association with psychiatric disorders or personality types actually goes back to the 20s, where they thought that if you were a, a certain psychiatric persona, it caused spasm of the retinal vessels and CSR. And so Unity was not the first person to link the two. They did um, personality types suggesting it was type A personalities. There's again a more recent Dutch study from Camille Boone's group suggesting that's not true. Um, it's difficult because we, we have an ascertainment bias. We all have these very intense people who have CSR. Or is it that intense people pick up their CSR and most other people just can't be bothered and carry on with their lives? I don't know if it's an ascertainment bias. Camille's Boone study suggests it may not be such a st strong thing as we thought. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea, there are some very nice case series on patients who have CSR-like changes, who have obstructive sleep apnea, go on CPAP, and it resolves. So if somebody looks like an obstructive sleep apnea phenotype, even though we don't have a good RCT, I think there's a... I mean, the fact that if you have obstructive sleep apnea and get CPAP is good for you and your survival anyway, it's something just not to forget as, a, as an option. And there are weak associations uh, with a number of other things that have never really been borne out. What's starting to come through now is, and what's interesting, is now the genetics. So the original genetic associations were from a New York group uh, that was never replicated in any other study. And this is a, um, a, a large GWAS study from a consortium from mainly Southeast Asia that was published in uh, Proceedings of um, National Academy of Science. And um, they did a GWAS with a continuous variable of choroidal thickness. And so they found that two genes were associated with choroidal thickness and um, separately on a separate study validated in another cohort with CSR and choroidal thickness. And interestingly, one of those genes is complement factor H, but not the allele that causes AMD. In fact, the allele that causes AMD um, is protective for CSR and vice versa. So this, need, this, this is yet another interesting story. Again, it needs further work. Um, and the um, odds ratio is not high. So having it is not like, um, I think it's about 1.4 odds ratio, uh, whereas if you're homozygous for CFH for AMD, it's about three. So it's not a super strong effect. But it's on replication cohorts. So um, there are fam familial CSR ca uh, cases, um, pa patients, but it's not that common. It's not as common as AMD, but um, interesting. Um, and there's another uh, VIPR2 gene. Again, we don't know fully what that does. So we're now starting to unravel some of um, the understanding which may lead to novel treatments. So uh, <laughs> treatments, what treatments have we got? So observation. Um, uh, if it's, you know, assuming the other eye is good and it's a classic a 
cute CSR and you know, the vision's not too bad, um, then sit on it. Most of them resolve in three to six months. Obviously, check and remove provoking factors if they're corticosteroid users. Obviously, if they're severe asthmatics, you don't know for sure if the steroids are the provoking factor and you don't want to end up having status asthmaticus in there. So you need to be in, have an honest discussion. And I've got patients with really severe asthma where you write to the respiratory physician and just all you can do is explain, is there any reasonable alternative? There are some new monoclo incredibly expensive monoclonals for asthma. Um, but you, you need to go through a, you know, an academic asthma center to get those in the UK um, if they get very bad CSR. Uh, remember, very occasionally you get Cushing's. I, anyone that's atypical, hypertensive, uh, has a Cushingoid phenotype, um, I um, consider testing, but you can't just do a random cortisol, even a 24-hour urinary cortisol being caught out, out with. Um, it can be normal uh, and not hit the abnormal range. So I've got to the point that if I've got a strong suspicion of Cushing's, I actually refer them to an endocrinologist because the ultimate test is a dexamethasone suppression test, and if you get it wrong, that'll worsen their CSR because you're giving them dexamethasone. So it's actually sli a slightly difficult diagnosis, and you can do simple things like if their visual field seems incongruous with the CSR, make sure they don't have a bitemporal hemianopia because they've got a pituitary tumor, which we have picked up in the clinic. So these are incredibly rare. And it's not that you should worry about that for every patient. But the trouble is, because CSR is so common, we switch our brains off with it. And so I try and ask filtering questions at their first visit just to make sure, i.e., they're not, they're not 25 on three antihypertensive agents and so on and so forth. So the first patient I got really caught out was the patient I inherited from my senior colleagues who was already under an academic hypertension unit at another hospital on two different antihypertensive agents. And because he was under the physicians, we thought, oh, that's fine. And we actually even did a 24-hour cortisol because he was young and I think it was normal. And because we'd seen him for years, he had really bad chronic CSR. Um, we kind of switched our brains off and gave him PDT, and it responded. And then about two years later, he pitched up, looking completely different, and he said, oh, we went back to a new registrar in the hypertension clinic who himself had CSR and said, you look like you have Cushing's, and you had a pituitary tumor, and massive, really high cortisol level. So <laughs> not that you should react to the one case you see in your lifetime, but I've, I, you, you get slightly nervous when, you, when that happens. Um, so, uh, so treatment options, observe argon laser, extra reveal um, leaking points. Again, um, these are trials done 20 or 30 years ago, and the trials were reasonable, small numbers, but it caused a more quicker res resolution of the CSR. So instead of taking three to six months, they kind of cleared up in eight to 10 weeks. But in long-term follow-up of those small studies, the vision was about the same. But nobody's really repeated those in the modern era. Um, um, no evidence of a decrease in recurrence rate. Um, Sub-threshold laser, huge vogues in this because it's, um, you know, lots of companies selling these devices. Um, and there will finally been a, a really nice um, RCT run by Camille Bruns group. I think Camille was the lead on this. Multi-center study called the PLACE study, which was half dose PDT versus sub-threshold micropulse and showed that the half dose um, was far superior in terms of um, resolving the subretinal fluid and uh, improving the visual acuity. Remember, natural history is pretty good in these patients as well. So um, half, half dose PDT, and the reason they compared it to half dose PDT is that we've got a number of small RCTs all consistently showing compared to sham PDT, whether you do half fluence or half dose, you get a similar benefit compared to sham. So, um, eight, so the, the kind of take-home numbers are about eight out of 10 patients with one or two PD, half dose or half fluence PDT treatments, the fluid will resolve. The average visual acuity will recover about a line. And if you don't do anything and it's persisting more than six months, the average visual acuity will drop about a line. So those are the sort of numbers I, I say to the patients. And these are just summaries of the um, various, some of, some of many PDT studies, all uh, by and large going in the same direction. So mineral corticoid an antagonist. So uh, Francine Baer-Cohen, um, who's a uveitis specialist uh, who was in 
France, then Switzerland, back in France again. Um, did lots of animal work looking at you know fluid mechanism, transport mechanisms in animal models, kind of observed that sort of uh, mineral corticoids seem to be important in fluid um, movement across the RPE, and therefore kind of started the whole vogue of mineral corticoid antagonists. There's loads of studies kind of going in both directions. Most of them suggest a benefit both for acute CSR and, and patients who don't respond to PDT or have chronic CSR. Um, and it's very difficult, given the natural history, um, to say they're definitively good. So after when I was in as a consultant after three or four years, many of my fellows went back to Canada and they emailed me saying, you're crazy. You should all be doing Avastin for CSR. We've been giving it, and they do great. The majority of my patients get better. Yeah, because the natural history is 80% get better. If you inject them, they're going to get better. So I think it's a hard group to do trials on. And I'm not saying it doesn't work. Um, and, you know, if you can't, get, you can't get access to PDT, given it's a relatively benign drug, and I'll explain about the drugs in more detail, it's something of an option, but I'm very honest with the patient about the lack of robust evidence yet. Um, so the um, mineral corticoid antagonist can be um, um, less specific, like spironolactone, that have uh, anti-androgen side effects and cause gynecomastia in men, which is not great if you're on it for a long time, um, and more likely to cause potassium side effects. But you don't get those problems in women, and the small studies suggest baronolactone may be more effective than a plerinone. So if it's a female patient, you may consider spironolactone. It also costs pennies. A plerinone uh, doesn't have um, the unpleasant male um, side effects on men. The potassium thing is mixed. If you look at the, so it's a drug used in heart failure. If you look at the heart failure literature, the, there was a control arm, and the potassium raise elevation in, in the control arm seems similar to the plenarone treated. But nevertheless, I start on 25 milligrams for the first month, have their potassium checked before and after, and if it's all fine and there's no, uh, no resolution, increase to 50. If there's no resolution at um, improvement at th three to six months, then I just stop it. The problem is if it does resolve, how long do you keep it going for? And, and, and this is something you need to have an individual discussion with the patient. And I just say, we haven't got an RCT, so on and so forth. Um, yeah. Um, so that's really it. Uh, quick walk through CSR pachycoroid. Any questions? So just before we move to the next one, because we're running out of time, yeah. your practice is watch the acute so, ones and then PDT and yeah, then move so, on to the antagonists. Yeah, so um, I, what I do is we finally got proper funding for PDT. It took me years. So we now have all patients whose CSR is persistent for more than six months. I, they're now, I can actually give them PDT, which took me years to do. So, and that's got the best evidence base. Um, if the patient um, uh, has done badly in the ride, doesn't want to wait the six months, or has a chronic CSR, doesn't respond to PDT, uh, um, I will offer mineral corticone antagonist with all the caveats. And we have a slight, uh, uh, weirdly, I now have a slightly harder time funding that than I do the PDT. Um, so that's kind of my uh, direction of travel. I, um, the argon laser is still a useful option, and very occasionally we do do that. Um, but now, um, but we, because uh, we really have PDT funding if it's foveal involving. Do the, your PDT machines still work? We, yes. They're still running? We, it's still eccentric. Can you fix them? It's still the extent, we have two. Okay. And they're gold. <laughs> and um, my oncology colleagues, uh, where's Mandy? No, he's not here. My oncology colleagues now increasingly try and poach them off me. Okay. Um, so no, we keep, make, absolutely make sure they're working. They're actually being used more so than they have yeah. been for years. Okay. Yeah. And you're using half dose or half? Uh... So we were using. So I, I'll explain. I, I was. What is a half dose and what is okay, a I'll half explain. dose? Okay. So <coughs> there are two ways you can do this. There's, when you do the PDT, the nurses have a normogram that when we did PDT for. Yep. Do you use a specialized Okay. Okay, I'll come to that. R ask me in a second. And you've got two minutes to finish, then yeah, we'll yeah, move yeah, on to yeah. the next one. Okay. Um, so, so you get a normogram. And it, you put in the weight and height, and it gives you the, the, the dose of vertiporphyrin to mix with the uh, saline to make up the syringe. You just half the amount of vertiporphyrin you put in. Um, then there's half fluence, 
where on the machine you have to change the settings, which are normally 50 joules over 83 seconds to 25 over 83 seconds. Um, the re we used to do um, full dose half fluent because the nursing staff who infuse it really didn't like changing the dose in the normogram. Our funding that we've got now is half dose because we can actually treat two patients within three hours of opening a vial. And part of our deal was we can treat more patients, therefore drop the cost. So we're now doing half dose. But if you look at the evidence, they come to about the same thing in the literature. Oh, yes. Oh, ICG. So, uh, so the problem is, if you look at all the trials, they all say, oh, you've got to use ICG-directed PDT, uh, PDT. The problem is, um, if, unless you use an SLO-based ICG, if you use a normal digital photograph, seeing a hyperfluorescent plaque is nigh on impossible. It's kind of diffuse. And even on an ICG, you may not see it. So um, I like doing it because of the differential of polyps, and I just like before I commit a patient to treatment, and I'm in an academic centre, that I have the luxury of being able to do that. Um, I like doing the ICG before treating every patient. But I think if it's a barn door CSR, and you have autofluorescence is quite useful because you can see areas that are abnormal, you may feel, I think it's not unreasonable although my um, Southeast Asian purist colleagues may argue with me just, just to treat uh, what's present on the OCT and the, uh, on that. If it doesn't respond, then probably you ought to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my mindset is, I, so I, I think the most effective thing is the PDT. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been doing it in my, the, the way you really get a feel, I mean, we've been doing it for so long. I do nothing, unless their other eye is done awfully, it's their only eye, um, and they're really struggling. In which case, the problem is my funding is only for six months, so it, then I may give them mineral corticoid antagonists. If they've done badly in the other eye, it's their only eye, and my funding doesn't kick in for six months. That's where I may use it. Again, not evidence-based, but it's part of how you have to deal with the patient. And would the same thing apply for the ones who recur? So would you consider this as a new episode or just you have to move on to PDT faster then? So you just wait again for six months just to resolve on its own? Yeah, so we've um, basically what we and do... And we need to if, define if what they, the recurrence no, is. No, if we, part of our deal and uh, part of our evidence base, if um, they have not settled down after two PDTs... I, that's it. Two properly done PDTs. Um, and I discussed this at length with my colleagues in Hong Kong and Singapore, who were the ones who really drove a lot of this, and they give up as well. They just do two. Very rarely three. So no. Um, it also does, there is five-year follow-up, and it does, unlike the other treatments, does decrease your risk of recurrence, having PDT in the eye you've treated. Your last question, and then we move on to Petros, please. Ah, good one. So, in the small studies we have, no. However, we know in the original full-dose PDT trials, 1% to 4% of patients got an acute visual loss, probably because of choroidal ischemia. But the choroidal ischemia is probably how it works as well. And also, the choroidal ischemia was a good prognostic sign when you were treating wet AMD. But those patients don't recover vision. They drop um, quite a few lines of vision, Half of them will recover, but they often get slightly washed out passive vision. So, so since the original trials, there's been one case report of somebody having acute visual drop, not recovering from half-dose PDT. So I tell them that we don't have great numbers because the trials are small, that in the full dose, it's 1% to 4%. There has been an occasional case report of people losing it even with half-dose. It's an acute visual loss, not systemic side effects. And I therefore warn them it's probably less than 1%, but not zero. Okay, thank you. We've got to leave it here now. Let's uh, ask uh, Petros now to give us the final talk on myopic CMVs and myopic.